surface area available and mixing potential, but you will burn some of the charcoal. Okay? That exact ratio there, we haven't been able to characterize yet, but I, I think it's like 80-20 or 90-30. Completely pulling numbers out of the sky. I don't know. But we do know that you preferentially burn the gas, both from first principle as well as, well as it just it works in the end. If you were preferentially burning the char, there would be nothing to reduce. Okay, so we know we're preferentially burning the gas. Okay? The problem is, we're preferentially burning that gas in a charcoal environment. Okay? So the second we burn any of that gas, we now have CO2 and water vapor. And remember, that wants to react with the hot charcoal. Well, what's the environment you're doing this in? You're doing this in all of the open space between the charcoal. Your combustion vessel is all of the stuff that's not fuel. Your combustion vessel is the indirect result of the size and shape of your, your biomass. Your combustion vessel and your cracking vessel is your void space. Okay? So that this is why you get into such fuel sensitivity in a, in a downdraft gasifier, is that the vessel that you have where you're trying to do this combustion and then maintain high temperatures to crack the rest of the, of the, the tar is all the space between the fuel. So we often think of the, the dimensions of a reactor as like, well, how did we shape and size the, you know, the, the physical metal, which it's relevant, but the second you use a different fuel, you've, you've similarly changed the shape and size of your vessel. Okay? Um, so we, it's really, in many ways, more accurate to think of your vessel is the void space in your fuel. So as you change the size of the fuel, you change the void space and your ability to complete these hard cracking things. Okay? So, not only have we changed you know, the vessel dimensions by that void space, we also see that just we're, the, the, the nature of the vessel is that it's working against us during the cracking. Again, what we're trying to do here is to partially combust the available tar gas and crack the rest of it. And we have, we have we have, we have a surplus of tar gas um, that we need to convert, okay? So we're partially combusting the tar gas and trying to maintain adequately high temperature and time to crack the rest. You need both temperature and time to crack that tar gas. The problem is, as soon as we combust any of it, it's completely surrounded by char. That char is reactive to the, the combusted gases. It's reactive, reactive to CO2 and water vapor and it starts the reduction reaction, okay? It's, then when the reduction reaction is endothermic and it pulls heat out of the environment. So the char during the cracking stage is fighting us. It's like we're trying to run this cracking vessel under a water brigade. Um, it's constantly, essentially, throwing water on this process that we're trying to maintain at a high temperature. So this is the foundation of the famous difficulty of finish your tar cracking in a downdraft gasifier and why there's so much attention paid to the fuel size, and why these things really only worked historically with this absolutely perfectly produced chunk of fuel that was you know, an inch to two inches in diameter and cut as these little plugs. The reason for that is it created a large void space between the material and it minimized the surface area. Okay? As fuel size gets smaller, you increase your surface area by mass. I think that goes to second power or third power. Forget. Okay. So as material gets smaller, it gets more and more reactive. You have more and more surface area. So not only do you lose your void space, you also increase the reactivity so that your reduction goes faster and you pull the heat out of the bed faster. Okay. So this becomes the difficulty in running small fuels, whether that's ag waste or rice husks or general shredded fuel, is that you can't, you no longer have the void space such that you can't get the cracking or the time to do the cracking and you also increase the reactivity such that your reduction happens faster and you pull the pull it the heat out of it faster. And the reduction interferes with the combustion. Yeah. The crack. Yeah. Because it makes it colder. So yeah. You can't crack. Exactly. So you ideally want these things separate. And I'll show you some reactors here later where you're separating out the combustion and cracking into its own dedicated open area where you do that in a controlled manner independent of the space between the fuel and then you reintroduce the gas after combustion and cracking into the reduction area. This combined combustion reduction area that the Ember has is, is an unsolvable problem or 
It's, un it's not solvable without fuel control, okay? Which is why we, these reactors always end up in some level of fuel control regime. So we say in World War II, yeah, they ran biomass reactors, but realistically, they had a standardized fuel that was as standardized as pellets. They made very specific chunks. They delivered them in bags at 8% moisture content. So you couldn't mess up. But you, I mean, yes, there was still lots of messing up. That's where I'm throwing away after the war. But it, they were premised, they worked because of the fuel preparation and, and the control of its delivery. So now, you know, we want to we want to run waste biomass. Okay? We want to run the stuff that we have around, which never looks or almost never looks like this perfect chunk. Okay. What, what were they doing to prep the fuel? They weren't just using logs. They were grinding them up into smaller pieces. I wasn't aware of that. They well, they often sliced them. They would they would use a knife and slice them, and then they had like a quarter. Um, that they could quarter them, or they had another like a chunker machine that they we did, they feed in little branches and would break them off. Are those like eight inch sticks? No, no, they were they were usually plugs about an, in, an inch to two inches long and an inch to two inch in diameter. Okay. There's a guy in Willits who's got something called a spiral shear. He's going to take coarse things and branch wood. That's Ed Burton. They're running it through this thing and just making little cylindrical chunks. Mm. Chunkettes. Chunkettes. Yeah, there's a bucket of them around here. Yeah, so there, so gasification projects often end up with some sort of exotic chipper, or not chipper, but chunker machine on the front, which similarly is a um, you know, can be a big liability. Um, so uh, you know, the the good chunker machines um, are are significantly more expensive than the wood chipper machines. So and the first step on what we've been we've been working. On, you know, with the downdraft, um, we've tried to get it to the point that you can run regular wood chips, and we've succeeded in doing that. So, wood chips are uh, we uh, you know, machines to make wood chips are ubiquitous in this part of the world. So, it seems not unreasonable to say, okay, we can standardize a, a solution around wood chips because that's the standard thing we have right now. Okay, but wood chips have significantly less uh, void space than these chunk fuels. Okay. So you see all the people that are running gas fires on vehicles or you know, any sort of regular situation, they're hand making the fuel, you know, because we're all zealots and you'll sit there and like you know, cut it apart. And that's okay for a couple of zealots, but it's not going to work for like more typical humans that want to operate these things. Okay. So how does it relate to the wood pellet industry? I mean, does that they work? Well, wood pellets will work, but wood pellets are difficult because they're very small. They have a lot of surface area, and the void space is, is um, non-ideal. So you have both of these things fighting you. The, the reduction starts quickly because of the high surface area, and there's not much void space, so the gas is going to hit those surfaces quickly. Okay? So it's difficult to get the combustion and crack, or the cracking to fully finish. You can, but it's going to be much more sensitive in the, at the rate at which you're running it. The other issue with pellets is in a lot of these reactors, you end up with a lot of steam in the hopper. Okay, you see the heat's coming up, it's, it's, it's vaporizing the water out, out, of, out of the fuel, but it's a closed top, so that steam's sitting in the reactor, and the pellets will begin to, to decompose. Okay, so there's ways in which you can separate the, the, the pellets off from the reactor, but just a typical downdraft single vessel unit that has that fuel sitting on top of the heat you'll get sawdust in there, okay? You can typically run it and keep it going okay while it's running, but when you shut it down, you'll still get the steam blooming and the fuel's not moving and it'll decompose, okay? So, downdraft gas fire, this was the basic solution. Let's fix the chemical problem, but do that at significant cost of the thermal problem, um, such that we now have this tremendous moisture sensitivity, okay? And there's, a gigantic way, amount of ways in which we can do this. All of them are premised on some sort of restriction so that we can, we can um, concentrate the path at which the, the, the hot fuel gas or the hot combustion gases have to pass through and try to fully um, propagate or spread this high temperature. Um, but there's, and then deliver the air somewhere above that such that we can create that combustion event. But the ways in which that's done are highly variable. And they vary both on engineering um, 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 interests as well as, as manufacturing interests. So the Embert was done as an hourglass hearth, okay? Uh, and it was a 
formal cast hips. The air came inside. Okay, the air comes inside. Um, that casting of that hourglass hearth is difficult. There was a, sim a simplification that said, well, let's actually, let's actually just um, make a cone at the base and let the top cone um, um, passively form in the char and the ash. Okay, so you just make the restriction and the cone downward, so that won't set up. But everything above, because of the angle of repose and how the gases are moving, that top can passively form. So Why do you was, actually need that cone at the base? What? Why do you need that cone in the reduction zone? Well, the most simple forms actually get rid of it, um, too. You just say, well, let's um, lose our slide here. So just let's put a constriction plate. This is how a hole. Okay. So the gas will go from the, we'll get an angle of repose at the top. And then from there downward, you'll get, you'll get an angle of repose of the material. The problem is you're going to get void space up around that top. So the gas will tend to come out and go out and not be in the fuel. Okay. So that's why it was put on the bottom. Okay. Now the liability of that is, is that the, the amount of friction of the fuel against a passively formed um, cone is, is much higher than the metal cone. So although your shape is the same, the passage of fuel is a little different because the metal cone gives you a much um, smoother surface. Okay, so we used to use the, just the, the, the bottom cone and found for mechanical fuel handling reasons that it was more attractive to, to make the double cone. So that's why we made the double cone. Okay? So air can similarly come in from the sides. You can bring it in from the top. You can bring it up from the bottom. You have some preheating here. Um, or you can do this sort of J-tube or L-tube situation where you're bringing in the air opposite of the outgoing gas and trying to get the heat back into the air. Okay? And then there's a variety of open core designs um, that let air passively come in from the top. Um, gas is pulled off from the bottom and you get a, uh, some balance of those and you'll get a flaming pyrolysis front in the middle. I'm not going to go through the details of that right now. So, these are some of the basic types um, that we've seen historically and you know, we're still playing with today. Okay, so the GEC, here's a side view of the GEC. Uh, the GEC uses a, a double hearth for the reasons I just explained. Um, I'm very, as, you, as I'm sure you know, very interested in figuring out all of the extra heat sources that we can put back into this reactor such that we have the highest um, moisture tolerance and the highest potential temperatures for tar cracking. So, um, the air for the GEC comes in in the opposite direction of the, the outward going gas, and we do a rather elaborate heat exchanger um, starting about an inch from where the gas comes out of the re reduction area and following a long gas rising area out the outside. So, we're able to heat the, the the, um, the air to within 100 degrees C of the environment or from where it starts here. Okay. Gas comes out here about 700. Uh, we get the gas up to 600 by here, 600 C. Okay. Um, the problem is, or the, the benefit or the reality is that there's much more heat coming in there. There's much more heat in the outgoing gas than the air can take up. There's about twice the amount of available heat in the outgoing gas as the capacity of the incoming air can absorb. Okay? So you can't fully cool the gas with the air. I mean, the other benefit here, other than getting the air hot, is we can also get the gas cooled. The gas, after it's come out of the base here, um, is 700 C, but we want it to be at 40 C at the engine, 30 C, as cool as possible. So we have to cool that. Now you can add a bunch of radiators and components to do that, but ideally, you'd like to use that heat. That heat is energy. Let's use it to be something useful. So we go through a multi-stage um, heat mining, uh, heat recovery process to get that heat back into the reactor for some useful work. Okay? So the first step of that is the, is the air preheating. So we get the air to 600 C, and the gas out here is somewhere in the 200 to 250 range at the end, at the end of this. Okay. Um, and that's basic there. Okay. Now, in a typical 